as we talked briefly about yesterday, we sometimes release new editions of iPhone. So editions are the releases that we make where we, um, although you can mix the versions of the events you send freely, it's totally fine to, to uh, I mean, the same service can send uh, different versions of the same event type, that's totally fine. But we do use editions as a way to sort of organize um, a baseline complete set of events. And we do this on a somewhat regular basis, roughly one time per year, depending on how many things we've got. And it's common for SDKs and other applications to not, they only upgrade to, to new editions. Uh, they don't continuously bring in new versions of events because every single change we make, we, we uh, bump the version of, of the events. Um, so um, there could be a rather large jump between a version of a particular event between two editions because of several intervening uh, versions. But usually, probably a good suggestion to only use uh, event versions that are the ones present in, in an edition. So the next edition is Santiago, named after uh, Estación Central in uh, Santiago de Chile, um, which was designed in 1990 or made in 1897 and designed by Gustavo Efe, yes. And that's why we name the editions. Um, we name them from, from uh, his, his creations or, or at least places where um, where he has has uh, designed buildings and so on. So we are starting to run out of places that don't have very difficult to spell words or, or accents or, or such. So I, I don't know what comes after Santiago. That's a problem for next year. So let's talk about what goes into Santiago. It's a fairly small edition. We feel that it's, it's, it's time to release a new edition. There are some things when to get out there. But it, it, it's fairly small compared to the previous editions we made, but that, that's okay. They don't have to be large. So first of all, we are, this is in a way a very, very large change actually. Um, we use JSON schemas for describing the events. And up until recently, we have used a fairly old draft of the meta schema for, for these schemas, uh, drafts dash zero six, which is probably the latest one when the initial um, open source drop of Eiffel was made in 2016. But since then, a number of other new meta schemas for JSON has been made. So um, the currently most recent one is 2020-12. The reason we did this change is simply because it provides more, more features, really, more ways of describing uh, JSON schemas. The main thing we wanted to get at is the ability to have validation of the links and the link types. Uh, that was the main, the main driver. Um, I don't recall the exact details of why you couldn't do that or if your uh, analysis is better, but maybe not important. Um, so we currently have the possibility of validating the links in terms of what links a particular event can use. So you can't use, uh, it'll reject your event if you are trying to use a, a, I don't know, a subject link in a source chain, for example, that would be invalid. Previously, that, that would be not be caught at all, but it doesn't validate all the aspects of, um, of, of, of link types. Um, for example, it doesn't, there are mandatory link types for some event types. It doesn't validate that you actually provide all the mandatory links. Uh, well, that's, I, I think it's doable, I guess, but. Um, that is actually, we, we do validate that you include the mandatory links. Okay, sorry. We, we do not, we do not, uh, don't remember it all now. We do validate that the mandatory ones are included, but we don't verify that the any other link that, that you provide is approved according to the optional link. Okay, type. okay. So it was the, the exactly the opposite of what. Okay, so mandatory are checked, but not the, the, the total. Okay, good. So, so there, there's an opportunity for for making it better in in the future. And there could be other other aspects of, of JC schema that we could apply to other other fields and 
properties in the events. Um, we haven't looked too much into it, but it, it's a nice upgrade. And over time, um, the library support for the various JSON meta schemas is probably going to, you know, 2012 12 is more likely to work with, with libraries than, than the old draft 06. Right, this is something that came out of, of um, in general increased focus in, in security. Um, for a while, we have the possibility of having digests or checksums for artifacts, uh, but we realized that logs are in a way also artifacts, and we want to track and make sure that we, if, if there is tampering on the logs, we want to know about it. So along with uh, the logs, the persistent logs attributes for activity finished, test case finished, and test suite finished, you can optionally, if you want, provide uh, a digest of the log contents. Obviously, you can't you can't change it afterwards, but that's that's sort of the point. And this is also uh, a nice feature. Um, confidence level modified event that describes um, changes in confidence in typically an artifact. Previously, we couldn't uh, express what what tests we actually, um, sort of the, the, the basis of the decision. We could link to other confidence levels and say that because we have these other confidence levels, then we also have this one. But we couldn't say, for example, that uh, because of this test execute, these test results, we therefore uh, express this confidence that wasn't possible to say. So this feels like a pretty, pretty significant um, addition. But technically, very small. It's just a new link type. And two more small changes that were too too small to render uh, a slide each, so that they, they get to share a slide. Um, really, just the documentation changes that don't affect the schemas. Uh, well, they will actually affect the schemas. It would be strictly about when we um, modify the schema versions, but. Yeah. Uh, we're going to improve the documentation of public keys and signatures. And how long how, how, how you're actually supposed to uh, populate those fields? It used to say, or it currently says, I should say that that hasn't emerged yet. Basically, says that, you know this is this is a string with the public key uh, used or with the signature. But with cryptography, there are just so many encodings and representations, so it wasn't at all clear what kind of representation it was. Uh, very much ambiguous. Um, so I think that's it's, yeah, it's, it's been for, for, for quite a while, but since nobody's implemented signing, uh, it hasn't really been discovered. But once you start, you know, digging into the details and implementing signing, this became pretty obvious. The second one is that we just we've been talking about should we have a separate event to express code review approval um, to complement the usual source change events, and we realized after some discussions that no, we don't really need it. We can use conference levels for it. That's really what it is. Uh, special case of confidence level and confidence level modified could already be uh, pointing to source changes. So it was no no technical changes in, in uh, the schemas at all. It's just a, a matter of documenting that if you want to uh, express code review pre approval, use confidence level modified. Maybe we'll give some recommendations what to call those confidence levels. I don't I don't know. It's still use, useful to have in, in this context since you could use it this to, uh, for example, trigger expensive tests uh, based on approvals where you don't want to start the expensive tests until someone has actually um, thought it, it's, it's, you know, it, this is actually a good idea. Right, so beyond Santiago, we do have a few ideas that we're going to implement after Santiago. Uh, first of all, um, there is currently no way, no, no, well, there's no dedicated event for expressing source code tags, um, which is super weird. Um, that has, has annoyed a number of people. There is a sort of a workaround that both Ericsson and we use, where we send, see if I get it right, we send first an artifact, um, 
and then a composition that links to the artifact, and together they describe the tag. Yeah, that's probably not the best way, but it's it's what we can do right now. So we're going to introduce uh, a new a new event in the source change family of events, and hopefully we'll do it in a way that is going to be forwards compatible with the new source change events. Which brings me to my second bullet here. Um, as I mentioned briefly uh, yesterday at the, uh, the panel discussion, we have been talking for many hours about the new source change events. And we were touching upon it actually this morning as well with the, the sub modules. And there is a proposal um, that we talked about at the last summit in, in June last year that I think we're pretty much in agreement that yeah, th this would work. Uh, but you know we'll have to discuss details more and think things through a little bit more. There are some open questions, um, but it it will be much less abstract than the current source change events, and it'll be much closer to Git, and they will be exclusive to Git. We will drop any any attempts to um, support their case or material or anything else. It doesn't mean we can't add such uh, possibilities in the future, but for now it's going to be Git only. And um, yeah, we're going to be much closer to, to the actual Git object model, which will, I think, make it easier. In a way, it'll be more complex. It'll be several more events, and it will probably take a while for someone implementing those events to understand how they should be used but it'll cover more use cases than the current events. Um, current events don't support, for example, branch creations. You can't really express that. It doesn't support fast forward merges. It doesn't support, um, I don't know, merges. They're supported at all really um, in a reasonable way. And if you push straight to a branch, it's not really clear how that should be modeled. So there are just several things that make it pretty hard to, to model all kinds of, of, of Git reality with the current events. So we're addressing that, but also introducing some complexity. On the other hand, the events are going to be, since they're much closer to, to Git, if you know Git, then you understand these events and vice versa. So there's a strength in that. And yes. I hope we can, we can add more changes to the coming edition as well, but these are the, the most obvious ones that we have in mind. Questions or comments? Uh, events for like rebasing the commits that goes away when you rebase. What happens with them? Do you handle them? Um, I mean, what would happen technically is that you're creating new events and the old ones would just be orphaned, just like the commits. So I don't I don't think it's I mean it's technically it would be nice if like the the, the the rebased commits could link to what they used to be. The problem is that it usually takes place locally. So then we would have to send those events locally, which opens up a whole other can of worms. But it's actually it wouldn't be impossible to implement because one of the sort of key Key features of the new source change events that we were moving closer to Git, so we would have one one event for uh, at least in, in the current design, one event for a commit that doesn't include anything that's not in the commit object itself. In other words, that commit event would not include information about repository or branch or anything that isn't in the commit object. Uh, so those could be sent locally. And in that case, you could technically probably uh, have those when you do a rebase, the, the old, the, the new, the, the events for the new commits could link to the old events for the old commits. I, I'm I'm not sure it would be worth the effort, frankly, but it would be technically possible, assuming it's a rebase done on on the kind. If you're rebasing um, in your uh, you're, you're doing sort of online, in, if you're letting you know, Gary from GitHub do, do the rebase automatically when you merge your, your thing, that would be another matter. But it would have to be up to the whoever is uh, 
plugging or whatever that, that's implementing the sending of, of the source change events. Thank you. Uh, regarding AFA protocol, if we skip the source code, could we say that it's so major now that there is no more changes coming? But you fought through everything during the years and said, hey, this is so great. I would like to be able to say that. But you are good. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, there is, I don't think it's a coincidence that the, the, the future plans is relatively empty because, I mean, we, we do think it covers uh, a lot of things and, and sort of the, the, the amount of changes that it made has sort of decreased over, over the years. And with the addition of deployment events um, last spring, I think we, we covered that as well. Uh, we have been talking about supporting incidents and sort of taking it more more into the, the operations arena, which would require you know, man, many new additions. Uh, but we don't have any concrete plans. So these, these are more like the, uh, the really concrete ideas we have. But if we want to expand it even more, I don't think there's... Well, I think we should have the discussion whether we should expand it to, for example, operations or we stick to the, the slightly smaller scope. Um, but it's... The, the, there are no concrete plans for that. List. One thing that, that actually has come up that we talked about is the environment concept. And uh, NASDAQ has been um, expressing a desire to have you know, richer environment descriptions or being able to, to group resources. I, mean, I don't recall the details. I don't know if you, you guys do that. But it's, it's nothing in, in the immediate plans. Um, for environment, there is a generic URI field that you can use for link to uh, a fuller description of the environment. So the sort of the the, um, the poverty of, of the existing environment definitions is, is maybe maybe you shouldn't try to cover like all the, the possible ways of describing environments. We did talk about that when we talk about deployment events. I mean, should you should you should be should it be standardized ways in IPOL to like describe blue green deployments or canary deployments and so on. And we, we decided mm, let's let's get something out the door for deployments and we can think about the, the colorful ones some other time. Because it gets it, it gets pretty hairy pretty quickly. And should also notice that uh, we do have some ideas on things that are not that pretty, so we would like to change, but those would really be backwards and compatible changes. So we are hanging on to those as long as possible. Yeah, you're, you're probably thinking of like relations, de de dependencies and so on, I think. Uh, yeah, we got some events where it's, we basically got a ton of links and no data inside of it. The problem's a bit strange. And you can actually go from one event to another one, depending on the link type, not about the data. And uh, that's a bit strange. So there are some some stuff we're thinking. And also, as Emma's point out, flow concept defined events uh, long ago is that actually good to have the flow context defined event. All right, thank you. Okay, thanks. Q and A session. Any good questions that pop up during the uh, Take. <laughs> yeah, perfect. So, really small. Um, when will the Santiago edition be released? I don't know if you mentioned it. Perhaps. No, I didn't. Um, I should have. I think the, the, the target is brand of September. So it's it's good enough, I think. I have a Q and an A. Sure. Yes. Um, one thing I, I, I probably also should have mentioned uh, in the previous talk is um, one thing we've been talking about, not in super concrete terms, but we noticed that Eiffel and open telemetry traces are somewhat overlapping in functionality. And they, they both, Eiffel activities and traces describe things that happen over time. And it would be useful to be able to somehow uh, link them together um, sometimes when you hear open telemetry people, they sort of don't understand why event protocols to CI CD are even a thing. You could just use traces for it. But we argue that they they, they are both useful and one cannot replace the other. However, 
uh, if you are either, you know, you're, you're processing a spam and, or you, you are within a spam and you are processing an ITIL message, it could be useful to um, set the spam attributes that would uh, point to that event. Likewise, if you are, um, uh, if you are sending an event from a spam, it could be useful to link the Eiffel event to the spam from which it originated. So I'm somewhat in the favor of adding an attribute to the meta field, probably name something like trace parent, which would contain the trace parent attribute, which is fairly standardized and actually not tied to open telemetry, but that would allow us to get the link in, in that direction. So it's a very small addition, but it would help in some use cases. So that's another one possible uh, addition. Q&A in one, any comments on that? Uh, has there been any uh, discussions in regards to using, uh, instead of saying, uh, sending JSON everywhere, uh, sending maybe, you know, binary encoded JSON, encoded box, mm -hmm. sort of data formats in order to maybe reduce the loads on the system have to deal with them, maybe speed up the process in you know every everything. But I don't know I have a answer. <laughs> Wait. No. I don't I don't think JSON processing is really a, a bottleneck in any any such system. So I think the draft. Um so I, 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 it's certainly possible to do so, but I don't think it's it will be you know solving a not problem, I think. I mean, sure, JSON DCRSA is a zero it could be a problem, but the, the frequency at which typically you would send events, it's yeah, it's just insignificant. But you know, if you have signs that would indicate otherwise, I, I'm certainly interested, but that's that's my 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 hunch. No, it was just more of a question if that topic has been brought up. Um, I, I don't believe we've talked about it ever, actually. Okay. So, I don't know who to address, but I guess I can see would be the default address. Let's do it. So, uh, you know, spinning off the discussion about using um, events for um, tracing and monitoring machines. Has there been also any discussion about to be used in the event as a representation of um, an information flow or, or instead of having sort of discrete set of mission points? Replace some various weird events. As there are sort of theories on how we can compress the sort of sort of the set of data in, into a smaller set of events and then represents that all the time. But has that been part of it? Or we're just talking about sort of phrases um, as sort of the event usage of machine data. No, no, I'm not aware of any such discussions at all, actually. Sounds interesting, it sounds interesting, but not something we're talking about. I happen to read a, <clears throat> I think also a thesis or academic paper on sort of mathematical principles on how we can compress data. Basically, the, the, the way in which we compress video and so forth is just punishing data, sort of data flow, sort of into, into sort of smaller compressed data, and basically very long, to where we sensed by as events. But would that be a way to, you know, what, what's what's the end goal? Will you transmit other kinds of information or? Reduce the bandwidth. Okay, okay. Uh, Severely reduce the bandwidth. And also the, the information representation. For example, if you have a measurement that says I have 90% CPU load for a very long time, to do that traditional way, but to send out every minute that you have 90% load, Instead, you can represent that with one single event statement that from yesterday. So, have just one transmission. You can reduce the transformation of data, but also the storage for the same. It sounds more something for, for maybe open telemetry than the NIFL events, probably. Mm -hmm. But it's still events. It, yeah, sure, in a way. Yeah. Low level events. Oh, yeah. oh very good. Thanks. Just a reflection. Uh, I mean, JSON is just the schema that the uh, Eiffel protocol is implemented. So if uh, the community feels that there is a need of this, uh, 
yeah, we can contribute to have a protobuf and instead of JSON. And, uh, but yeah, someone need to build the, all the tools and ecosystem around. So it's, uh, yeah. And uh, usually it's a problem when you have a mission critical CI the system when uh, you really need something like thought about. I think JSON works fine for regular CI system. So I just want to raise a little bit selfish that's sort of reiterate the question that was called up yesterday about um, how to implement sort of zero trust based um, event based infrastructure. So and I think it comes with the discussion about signing. So um, I have to do some interesting thing, uh, implementing things, but I just want sort of going more <coughs> into sort of where we want to aim with this sort of zero trust and, and how far we can and get that, and also what, what the use cases are generally where we see that it makes different benefits at the moment, and also where we can see that that will go into if we should submit in entire flows or just in the later part of the flow, and where we'll see that those signing functions needs a good um, use in business case. Um, I mean, basically, I think all events should be signed theoretically at least, but if you there are certainly some some events, kind of events that are less crucial to sign. Um, but in principle, everything should be signed. Regarding the, you, you talked in the break earlier about having like secure zones where everyone wouldn't have to verify signatures, for example. Uh, I think probably we should avoid that because it goes, then, then you suddenly, you don't have zero trust. You have, you trust those zones. Um, so I would probably argue that you shouldn't do that. But of course, it, it creates a problem that everyone needs to be able to verify. And then you need to know what keys should be used for verification and possibly also the policy of who is allowed to say what um, needs to be either distributed to everyone or, or centralized. Then you have the centralization that becomes a point of trust. Um, and if but both one 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 point of trust, but also you know more infrastructure. So, um, but I don't know. Probably something that wouldn't be the protocol would be agnostic of that. That would be up to each implementing organization to choose what you know should they use um, <clears throat> certificate based key distribution, for example, uh, if they have CA infrastructure, CA infrastructure, or if they want to do you know something else. Of course, it's still relevant, even though it's not part of the protocol, it's still relevant to you know, discuss in, in this form, of course. But as I, I mentioned yesterday, what we're probably aiming for is to use, have a local certificate authority that uh, issues certificates um, with, of course, identities in them and have them stored in one place so that people easily can access all the certificate with the public keys and the identities and use that to establish, to, to be able to authenticate each event they get. And it would be up to them to have local policies to decide, you know, given the event I get here and, and the identity, should I, should I trust it or just throw it away? So the question would be sort of how complex this would be, would be more be on the receive side. So if you pay for this, all events should be signed, whether it's sort of used or not, and then it will that for this the basis. And then if you want to go further, you make sure that you verify it. And that would be sort of the tricky part, particularly when, when it comes to sort of this, how far should you go with this sort of zero trust? Because really with zero trust, you should definitely sort of verify everything by yourself, but you probably need to have a service to do that. And yeah, I mean, you need to trust, trust something. You go beyond your zero trust definition, when you should extend that in your trial, so it's all sort of matter of definition on uh, how secure it can be and what is the business case work as well. Yeah, I yeah. Never know that. No, me neither. I mean, as, as in terms of security work in general at Axis, we, we try to not be dogmatic about anything. It's just as, as long as we're continuously approving things, you know, we're, we're, we're doing OK. Uh, so we have to start somewhere. Yeah, uh, if you're using certificate based, you, you would still have, you would have to trust the CA. If you don't do that, it's, yeah. 
it's hard. So um, where in your level have you seen the most value for users signing? We have just hardly started sense. using it yet, but but sort of the what actually prompted us to um, to start signing or, or looking into that was that we are implementing implementing a new service that will make all the builds and use iFlow for the signaling. And then some realized that well, if we send artifact created and artifact published with the URIs of our very important files. How do we know that someone is just injecting something else? Um, if we don't use Eiffel for this and rely on other means, like you know, we we start a Jenkins build, and when the build is done, we fetch the artifacts from that particular build. I mean, there's there are definitely security threats involved in that, but they're, they're pretty you know TLS and authentication goes a long way there. But once we start relying on events for such crucial things, we realize that we, we, we need to do signing or otherwise it's we just greatly decreasing security. So that's what prompted it and that's what where we're going to start. And I figure if we for those those services and tools that we have that uh, use, for example, the, the, the Go SDK, which supports signing, you know, why not enable signing as well? Um, but as long as we, um, for the tools that don't use an SDK that supports signing, you know, that will get lower priority. For example, Etoast, which uh, largely uses Eiffel Python lib still, right? Yeah, which doesn't support signing. So you would be introducing signing a lot later, probably. Oh, yes, yeah, so yeah, but you both, both Rem Rem and direct yeah but then again you could also argue that test events are in many cases at least less crucial to sign they are less critical even though sure if you can inject a you know positive test result and and trick someone to releasing something i mean there are threats but compared to being able to inject um artifact events the threat is vastly smaller well, I have a comment from from Ericsson perspective. I mean, I don't personally see the need for signing events that we send internally, since we have currently authentication towards the message bus. No one can actually access the message bus even without having granted access from someone that is allowed to grant access. Uh, and we use Rembrandt to send events, and as long as that authentication is in place. No one else should be able to come to the message bus really to, to tamper with the events there. Um, well, I, I don't really see the immediate need for our internal events, let's say. But what I do see a need for signing would be uh, we got a question yesterday, by the way, from I oh, was not here today. Uh, what about these if we consider dependency updates from uh, if we would have dependencies on FOSS and we would like to automatically update our our products based on deliveries from open source. Uh, would these dependency updates algorithms work there as well? Well, it would if if those open source tools would send events on some message bus that we could connect to. And in that case, that message bus would of course be, be published on the internet somehow. Uh, and in that scenario, I would certainly see that those producers of events should sign them, obviously, and we as consumers should should uh, verify them. Uh, that might be a stretch to to think that that would happen, but what I do think could happen, not that far off in time, is if we say, for example, one of the projects in the Alpha community, say the Go SDK, for example, if someone has a proprietary solution using the Go SDK, uh, built on top of the Go SDK, and they want to be triggered as soon as there is a new version of the Go SDK from the actual community, then we could actually quite easily set up a message bus on the infrastructure on the internet, which we actually have some box around already, which you could then connect your message bus towards and where it message is from, and then you can automatically trigger an update from, say, the Go SDK and automatically directly see uh, that happening in your own 
most of us. And then we shift sign that's since we open the nuts over the internet. But I want to push back a little bit on, on the no need for signing. But I mean, you even though you authenticate people sending events, you could still have compromised service accounts or that would then be able to send artifacts. I mean, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, of course we could. I mean, it always, you know, risk it's a matter of a society scale. Mm, yeah. But uh, I don't think that is the, the number one problem. No, at least <laughs> for us uh, in our yeah. infrastructure, there could be more important things. But of course, since we are dependent on the Eiffel events and we can't deliver source code without them, of course, if something would happen there, of course, we would be in a bad situation. Yes. So maybe I shouldn't be so calm about those things. Perhaps not. I mean, we we it wasn't so many years ago where we had all our artifacts when releases were on an NFS mock volume. That was writable by one thousand engineers or so. So yeah, you have to you have to start somewhere and go go someplace. Um, now I just need to go back a little bit to your implementation of of uh, the signing. Um, have you sort of thought about the the use case where I think you mentioned it briefly before um, <clears throat> when um, uh, when a certificate sort of is it's either compromised or it's being um, revoked by time, for example, and it's no longer valid because certificates are sort of having a life cycle. And combining that with the mutability of an event seems to be presenting a, a challenge, to say the least. Yeah, yeah. Have you thought about that in, in your way and in your use cases in the way? I've thought about it a couple of times and then I, I Things became complicated, and I thought about other things, basically. But, <laughs> but I mean, it, it it is a problem um, if you are pulling events out of the event repository, and you want to verify the signature, which is great that you can do that. But I mean, what happens if the certificate is is expired and no longer? I mean, it. Yeah, what 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 do you do? I I, I really don't know how to how to deal with that. Um, same thing with how to implement revocation. Um, if you're going to use, you know, revocation list or OCSP, or I don't know what the best option would be, but you should have some way of revoking certificates. Otherwise, you could end up in problems. Sure. I guess then the systematic approach to that would be to uh, reissue and revalidate existing events with sort of broken or invalid certificates. Um, so basically, you can sort of make sure that whatever has been stated is still true. But from another authority, which you now can trust. So, so the information is then there is still sort of is valid, but only if it can be validated by a certificate that is valid in some way because it's broken, you can trust it. If it can be revalidated, which means that you create a new event. Although, how do you do that revalidation? On the other hand, I don't know how that would. Then someone, yeah, um, in a way, I don't know if. if, if expiration of certificates is really interesting in this case. I mean, it's is it why for the, the, the certificates and keys I've generated so far in my testing have chosen, you know, ridiculously long um, lifespans simply because I don't know what what should be the reason for expiration. Yeah. Since, since things, I mean, it's one thing if you have, uh, have um, the keys are used in a relatively short lifespan. But these are keys that you want to be able to, they, they, they should live for a very, very long time, since events are relevant for a very, very long time. Yeah, true. I was just thinking about the fact that you may have breaches, so um, so it may be sort of broken for reasons, and, <clears throat> and therefore anything that is being sent or used by or using this, this uh, certificate is, is not a valid one. But of course, everything that has been uh, sent or used up to a certain point in time is yet to be invalidated. So the only thing you need to know is the time when the certificate was invalidated and all the events that were marked with previous dates before that, they are actually valid. So the only events that is sort of, you know, produced after that, which may be sort of in, in, in the area where, where you may sort of fraud information, those events maybe should be thrown away, but all the others probably should be fine because yes. at that time there were a breach. It's like going like a time machine. Doesn't mean that everything in, in back in time is invalid. Yeah. Only from the point where you discover the invalidity and, and mark that clearly somewhere in the infrastructure. So 
Maybe that is not really as big as one may think. If you can identify that specific time historically when exactly. it happened. This was when we discovered it, but when did it actually happen? Yeah. If you found out that, that the entire life cycle of a certificate has been a fraud, then of course you have a big problem. I guess a reflection on that one is we haven't really had a discussion on what happens if things events are wrong. For example, if you send out an event with information and realize later, okay, that was wrong. Or for example, if you link to a log, you remove the log. So I guess that there is some discussion in this area that we could have in a community meeting on how do you deal with like older information? Um, you, I think it was you, Magnus, who touched upon it before, uh, the removal of older events. And we, I think we said we were going to talk about it now. So I would like to just raise the question. I don't have any answers, but anybody have some comments, thoughts on it? Basically, my answer is just in, you know, well, another question. But, but I thought about this quite some time ago because we, we know that we have a sort of policy with no retention policy and we will at a point, grow at this point where we probably have to start doing it. So I was sort of thinking about having a sort of, let's say, continuous purging uh, of events, which means that events that are no longer relevant or classified. I also realized that, that purging um, events is somewhat quite challenging because you can't really sort of go for specific events. You have to go for event chain and treat. So basically, it's like you know, it, it, it's like moving an entire tree. You take you have to take the root, all the events and link to it, and you never know sort of where this ends. So if you want to shop things off, for example, I will not purge things with certain links or where you go, but you, you can't really think about the purging as sort of a single event matter. You have to look at the links and what they relate to and where they should put that into your context of purging and removal as well. So it can go into quite complicated matter. But I do think that having a scheme that would, let's say, continuously um, purge old events, uh, depends on time, would be something like a, um, you know, basically like you have sort of memory management, you know, you continues to take things that is not used and old and put that back into recycling and you don't have to make it such a big thing. But you need to have start and process somewhere and define what can be purged for what reasons. And and of course, you, you may work with, with schemes, for example, like long term or um, old stories and things like that, move it into that perspective. But then you have to sort of, if you break the chain of the linkage in the project, then you have to re stitch them again. So it can get complicated. That is why I was along with the thoughts, but we haven't gone into any implementation. So. No, no, I've just been tinkering with it a bit and we have talked about just purging sufficiently old test events because nobody really cares about it but i mean you would probably need to have some kind of continuous i mean you, since you can't i mean theoretically you could take an old test event and you could see is it, is it linked to by anything we care about like a release artifact or something like that but I mean, the amount of queries to you have to make to just be able to remove a small, small, tiny subtree out of millions of such would be very, very expensive. So you have to sort of figure out some kind of way to sort of, as the events arrive, that maybe you you keep like a separate ledger of if you do it for test events, for example, the the moment you get um, a test event that relates to something you care about. Then you make a mark in the ledger so that this, you know, this is something we should keep. And then you can use that, that cache, that information later on to, to actually do the purchase. Something like that anyway. But that could be an interesting master thesis, probably. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Uh, regarding the same follow-up regard uh, to the backup system that you have been talking in the morning. Uh, is there, like, the, uh, as you said, you've been trying to save these events for a long time. Yeah. So is there a plan? To kind of build a, a machine learning model on top of it of the failure events to see, okay, what is the occurrence of uh, like this is the failure that we are seeing quite often, and can we try to kind of build a model on top of it or something like that? I don't think we have any such plans. I mean, that's, that's more in, in the QA space. So we actually talked about something similar this morning, me and Andrea at, at breakfast. Uh, uh, this is where the AI workshops uh, just the day before. Uh, 
that that there might be something interesting that you could do there to 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 be able to chat or query the the event backlog, so to speak. We haven't done anything yet since we talked about it this morning, but uh, might be able to. You've had all day. Yeah. <laughs> That could be another master thesis. Yeah, yeah. To be able to chat with the entire event backlog about different things. Yes, so I would like to go back to the beginner question here, and that is uh, since even if I work with April for, for more than a year now in team and trying to model it uh, using the events that are available, it's very, very hard to see that we use great events at the great for the purpose that it's, I guess it's intended to be. Um, when I saw the presentation from the collector that you know today, uh, I realized that um, the FCD, the flow context defined event, we point in another direction. So instead of uh, creating a flow context defined first and then point back to it from artifacts, we actually use it as a container one to artifacts. And, um, and that is because the properties inside it um, is uh, related to you know, products. So I guess I really misunderstood flow context to find it. And I would like to see if someone can share some light on it. I, I think we're using it as a, a, a composition to find the event right now, just another layer of it because the properties are there. Interesting. So, so what type of links do you use in that FCD event that to your tracks? Oh, that I don't remember, but um, the ones that are defined, of course, because there are not many link types defined in that. Are we linking it to a CD? We're pointing back to an uh, artifact created event because we see it as a collection of binaries that uh, we define as a base, uh, and that comes after all the uh, binaries has been produced and then we build the baseline around that. Um, but when I saw the uh, presentation, I realized that you generate something first and fill that with information. Right. So, 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 going around. so what I hear is that you actually create a baseline, which we would call a composition in my film, uh, and then use the element link in the composition find event towards each of the artifacts that is included. Um, so yeah, the flow context defined event that we use in Ericsson is that we, we, when we set up a new project or we make a new track of our product development, or let's create a new, well, create a new project or a new branch in our development uh, organization or less within projects there, then we define this is now the context in which our flow will run and all subsequent commits on that often a Git branch connected to it, would then refer to the same flow context. You know beforehand what you're going to produce a field that context. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, as I also mentioned when talking about this, uh, how to aggregate events, uh, that we define our flow context and then we use them for a long time, sometimes years. That's that is a big problem for us on the way we use flow context events. In our legacy protocol version, the flow context is part of each event itself. So there it is a free text string actually. Uh, but we have a standard for what that free text string should look like. But then you need to include that text string in each event, and there is the risk that you miss write it, misspell it. And therefore, we thought when we open source in the protocol, well, why don't we externalize that information to its own event and reference it instead of every event? Because then no one will misspell it and we will easier find all deliveries that are related to that flow context. Uh, but I'm not sure that was a good choice, honestly, because yeah, we will not be able to use the solution such like the one you proposed there without having also an event repository look up in the beginning, looking for the flow context contents and stuff. 
And you don't have anything similar in Axis. You don't use any flow contracts. We don't use any no. no. flow contracts now. Back to you. Yes. Uh, also, see that the problem with composition defined, uh, which is sort of the way that we can uh, collect you know, things together, is also free text. Uh, it's not, it has a, a, a unique ID, of course, the April unique ID, but searching for it as such, we would like to find this container that it, uh, contains a lot of valuable information. And uh, then we use free text um, and call it something. But that something can be reused by someone else and then the query will be broken. Yeah. I think we would like to see more or less the fields that currently exist in the flow context and the project and the track in the whatever it is there as part of the composition dependent. You would like to see those there. Yeah, then we'll have chosen that. Yes. Maybe that's one way as well to do it. Yeah. Thank you. We use some naming conventions for compositions where we can encode uh, like a type and, and various other things in the name of the composition so that they are likely to be unique and then you can have some kind of structure in that data. This was a really good example of why we should Use a monthly meeting, use a Slack channel, read the documentation, and contribute to update the documentation so it's understandable by newbies. Because these guys, they are not newbies anymore. They don't think like beginners. They don't, they feel like, oh, everyone should understand what this is. That's a system. And now in Volvo, you have one opportunity. It's now, this year. To be the beginners. To take it, contribute to the AP community. Good. I have one question also. <laughs> Announcement. Are you using them for what? Yes, we are to be asked, right? We are sending it in this year tool. I remember that we discussed it. I don't know where we added it. Yeah, one, one, one occasion actually. Uh, so, when, for example, a timer fires and uh, you have a schedule build of some sort, it's not a source change that triggered your build, but you want to state what was it that triggered that this pipeline started or this build started. Uh, when it was not a source change, but it was something else, namely the timer or a schedule. Uh, in that scenario, we are currently implementing, in lack of a better ways to do it, we send an announcement that saying timer expired, and then we use that as the cause to the activity trigger of the pipeline that is started based on it. Which may or may not be a okay way to do it. It's not a good way, I would say, but it's the best way I could think about at the time, at least. It's creative. Yeah. It's an announcement. Timer expired. And I don't think we had, I think we had one other similar trigger as well to use an announcement for. I don't remember how it is this. Haven't we discussed uh, using announcements for um, incidents before we got them? Or is that my memory failing? Yeah, I think announcements, they have some strange properties in them for historical reasons. And one of them is severity, I believe. So people might not see an announcement that's something that has any severity at all, but that is there as, as a mandatory parameter, if you must be mistaken, or, which is quite strange when you use it as a timer, representation for a timer, because it's not really severe in any way. Um, so with since there is a severity in it, maybe you can use it as an incident reporting event, but that's not either a good way to do it, it's a way to do it. No, maybe not a good way. And then if you would have such report an incident using announcement event, you would then when you create an issue, create an issue defined event and reference the incident that's the announcement event from it. Probably using a course link. I was just thinking uh, announcements. Uh, wouldn't they be useful for outages if you're 
if the Tango already factor is down, um, you could, for one thing, announce that it's down, and when it's back up again, you could announce it and work off a queue or something. Just. I think that was actually the reason for creating it. I'm trying to browse the spec now, if I find it, what it says, what it's really used for. Is it necessary to that snaps can be good? Yeah. So we introduce a new timing event then. Timing expired. <laughs> Old announcement published event. Presents an announcement technically regarding any topic, but typically used to communicate any incidents or status updates regarding the continuous integration of delivery pipeline that is like outages. And it can be favorably displayed in visualization dashboarding applications. This event was defined in 2016 by Donny Stoll. He probably had a good idea of having it. I don't think there was anything similar in our legacy protocol. Um, but I guess he thought that would be something that could be useful, but then no one has used it since then until we now started to use it in back of something better. And it's, well, yeah. We have discussed it at least. So earlier, but not used it yet, or have we? We are doing it. But you see, there is a mandatory heading, a mandatory body, and a mandatory severity. It doesn't always make sense to send all those three events. Stay tuned, but yeah. For improvement. Hmm. Any more questions? I have one. When and where will the next summit be? Probably not here. But... Hello. Mallorca? Two pace. One pace cooler. Okay, but not Mallorca then. <laughs> I guess sometime next year. May it's hard to find time slots in the spring because of all long weekends and um, school graduations and, and whatnot. So maybe next fall is better. But it, you know, it, it depends on how much things we have to talk about. We've had at least a couple of times we've had smaller meetups. Um, we had one in Lund and one in Linköping, I think, where we had more smaller format and more. Sort of focused discussions. We had one where we, well, we didn't only talk about source changes, but that was one of the topics anyway. And usually just single day, I think, uh, events. So that, that's another option if we have, we have more focused. We want to meet in person, have it more focused, but not make such a huge thing out of it. I, I guess, or I hope that next year we are in, at one at least. We don't need a April for beginner. Maybe maybe we are doing it ourselves internally at Volvo. Then we can have more, uh, even more discussions back today. But, but I do hope that we need an April for beginners because that would mean that we okay. have yeah. new users again to the protocol. Next year. True. All right. Any more questions, or should we do the wrap up? I have. A, 45 minutes wrap up. Uh. <laughs> well, all right. Then I want to, want to say again, thanks for everyone that has supported with this, and also thanks all of you that joined. Uh, all the really good questions. And uh, as you said here in the end, mic drop leading with a uh, we have this year at Volvo. To really kick it off and uh, be experts. And uh, thanks a lot. I applaud everyone.